We ended the previous session looking at enumerations, which are ways of listing out the members of a set in an uh, unending sequence or series. In this video, we're going to use that notion to explore the boundary between being finite and being infinite. We introduced the notion of an enumeration. Uh, to enumerate a set, you just define a function from the natural numbers onto that set. So the function's got to be surjective or onto, which means that anything in the set x has got to be the target of some uh, input, some number as an input. So one way that I like to think about or represent such an enumeration is as a list where you might have the members of the set just listed out like this. The key idea in this function being surjective or onto is that this list contains absolutely all of the members of the set X. Nothing is left out. If I've got a function which can do this for a set X, we say that the set X is countable. We can think of this process as counting out the members of the set X. When a set is countable, it means that we can put its members in some order and deal with them one by one. This makes them tractable in some way. Another way that a set can be very easy to deal with or tractable is if it's finite. A finite set is either a set which has got no elements at all, the empty set, you might have seen the notation for this as zero with a slash through it. The empty set doesn't have any members. The number of members it's got is zero. So that's finite. And if I've already got a finite set, and if I just add one element to it, that's not going to make it infinitely big. It's still going to be finite. Uh, and so that's going to be a finite set too. So if I had an empty set, that's finite. If I add one element to it, then I've got a set with just one thing in it, that's finite. If I add another member to a set, so now I've got two elements, it's finite, and so on. All of these things are finite sets, but I can't add infinitely many, lots and lots of them, to make a finite set. So the only finite sets are the sets that I can construct in this way, just by uh, adding one at a time from uh, the starting point of an empty set with no members at all. So the empty set's finite, and a set just containing one and two is finite, because I've just added one to a, the empty set, and then I added two to that set. This set containing just A, B, C, D, and E is finite. But the set of natural numbers containing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and all of the count, whole counting numbers, the set that we call omega, is not finite. It's infinite. So if you think about all of the sets, I can picture the empty set at one end and this set just containing one member and sets containing two members and things like that over on the left-hand side of the picture. I've got a whole bunch of sets and in the left of the diagram, these are the finite ones. And on the other side of the boundary are infinite sets, like the set of all of the numbers. Now, over here on this side of the boundary, there's a difference in size between these sets. There's sets with nothing in them, sets with one thing, sets with two things, three things, etc. for any finite number. There's a question about the sets over here. Are they all the same size? Are they just all infinitely big? Or is there a way of distinguishing them? Are some of the sets, some of the infinite sets bigger than other ones? we're going to see that there is actually a difference in size between uh, different sets that are on the infinite side of the finite infinite boundary. And this is going to have a consequence for the kinds of things that we can do uh, with the language of predicate logic. So we're going to use the concept of an enumeration to define what it is for an infinite collection to be countable. Uh, an infinite collection is countable if there's a way to enumerate its members. So let's have a look at some examples of countable collections. The most basic one we've already seen is the collection of natural numbers themselves. They are self-enumerating. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. That set omega is itself enumerated by itself. If I look now at the smaller collection of the even numbers, I can enumerate them too. I just need to use a different function 
to pick out an even number at each stage. If I make my collection bigger and include the negative as well as the positive numbers, but now I can't use the usual order from smaller to bigger to enumerate them because there's no smallest negative number. Instead, I alternate between positive and negative numbers, positive numbers on the odd stages, negative numbers on the even stages. And the result is an enumeration of all of the positive and negative numbers, sort of starting from the middle and working out. We can do something similar and enumerate an even larger looking collection, the collection of pairs of numbers. If I try listing out the members of this table from left to right, top to bottom, I'd go 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and I just keep going on the top row and never get to the next row. And if I just do the top to bottom, then left to right, I'd start with the first column and would never get to the next one. So I've got to do something trickier, something smarter to enumerate all of these. So when I bite off bits of the table starting in the corner and then working outward like this, I can sweep across the entire table, listing every pair out one by one. The result is an enumeration which first has a pair where the two items sum to zero, then the two pairs whose items sum to one, then the three pairs whose items sum to two, then the four pairs whose items sum to three, and so on. In this way, we can enumerate all of the pairs of numbers. Once you've seen that, it's not hard to see how to enumerate the rational numbers which can be thought of as fractions between a positive negative number or zero on the top and a positive number non-zero on the bottom. The function that you get in doing this in the way that I've presented here is not a bijection. It's going to hit some rational numbers like one or a half again and again and again because uh, one is one over one and two over two and three over three and a half is one over two and two over four, etc. But that's still an enumeration, even if some things appear in the list more than once. Now, this list of rational numbers that you get looks nothing like the order that they come in along the number line. But the order that they come in along the number line is nothing like an enumeration. If I just look at this line of rational numbers. There's no beginning, there's no end, there's no next one along in between any two rational numbers in this line. There's more rational numbers. So the line is not a good guide to how to produce them in an enumeration. That's where this diagram comes in. Any rational number is going to appear on this diagram somewhere. And if I bite it off bit by bit from the top left corner, I'm going to get to everything in this orderly one by one sort of step, which if I plot that out on this line, it's like I'm jumping across the line and actually returning to the zero points and various points along the way many, many times before I get to, you know, 17 over 53. Uh, but I will eventually get to each and every number in this list. So it turns out that there lots of different sorts of collections like these can be enumerated. So if we continue with that diagram that we had before about the finite and the infinite collections, it turns out that among the infinite collections, quite a lot of them can be enumerated, quite a lot of them are countable. But are all of them countable? Is there any such thing as an uncountable infinite collection? Well, the German mathematician Gail Cantor uh, showed that there are such things. There are uncountable infinite collections. He showed that there were some sets that are so big that any enumeration has to leave some out. The simplest example that we can work with is what we'll call the collection of all of the bit streams, which we'll just use the letter B for. Here's what a bit stream is. It's itself an infinite list of zeros and ones, like these. The bit stream containing just all zeros. Zero, 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 zero. That's a bit stream. The bit stream just containing all ones. The bit stream that alternates zeros and ones. Here's another bit stream which goes zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one. These ones have all got different patterns that produce them, but you could have totally random bit streams too, which just 
uh, spew zeros and ones with absolutely no pattern to them. Any collection of zeros and ones is a stream of bits, provided that it never ends, provided that it goes on in an unending sequence. Bit streams are really useful in modeling what you might get down a digital wire uh, in some kind of process of digital communication. We can think of uh, various things that computer networks do as processing bit streams, taking in bit streams, doing things to them, and producing bit streams as a result. A really nice theorem of Cantor's is that the collection of all bit streams cannot be enumerated, it is uncountable. The way that he showed this is a process which is called diagonalization, and it'll be really easy to see why it's called diagonalization when you picture his argument. It goes like this. Suppose you had some enumeration of bit streams. So we have some function, which we'll call b, which when given a natural number, returns a bit stream. This is an enumeration of a collection of bit streams. What we will show is that there will be a bit stream which is not in that enumeration. There is some bit stream that was left out by your function b, so your function b isn't an enumeration of all of the bit streams. And this argument is purely general. It'll work for absolutely any function from numbers to bit streams, so it turns out there is no way to enumerate all of the bit streams in one go. So if you've got your function b, here's how we can picture what the function does. You take your function and apply it to 0 and 1 and 2 and so on, and place the result in a table like this. So b of 0 is itself a bit stream, b of 1 is a bit stream, b of 2 is a bit stream, and so on. So the way this notation goes is that bi is the bit stream in position i in your function. It's the ith one along in the list. And bji here is bit j in bit stream i. So b0, the first one off the, off the rank, first cab off the rank. And so b00 is bit 0 in bit stream 0. b10 is bit 1 in stream 0. Bit b20 is bit 2 in stream 0, and so on. And so uh, bitstream 1 is then b01, b11, b21, and so on. Bitstream 2 is bit0, bit1, bit2 in stream 2. So whatever function you give me, which is an enumeration of bitstreams, we can spread out all of the bitstreams on a table like this. And we're going to use this table diagram to specify a bitstream that cannot be produced by this function at any point. To do this, we will use the notion of the flip of a bit. Given a particular bit, 1 or 0, its flip is the opposite bit, uh, which we'll write with a line over the top. So the flip of 0 is 1, and the flip of 1 is 0. Now, given our table of bit streams like this, we're going to focus on these bits which are down the diagonal. So we're going to focus on bit 0 in stream 0, bit 1 in stream 1, bit 2 in stream 2, bit 3 in stream 3, etc. The following stream, the flip of bit 0, 0, the flip of bit 1, 1, the flip of bit 2, 2, etc., is a stream of bits which is nowhere here in this list. You can see why it's not in the list, because it's not in position 0, because the first bit, bit 0 in stream 0, is b0, 0, 0, whereas uh, bit 0 of this stream is the flip. It's the opposite of b0, 0. And similarly, this stream is not in position 1, because its bit in position 1 is the opposite of the bit in position 1 in stream 1. And same for stream 2, and same for stream 3, and same for stream 75. If I go all the way down to stream 75, and I look at bit 75 in stream 75, bit 75 in stream 75 is b7575, and bit 75 in this stream is the flip of b7575, which is never the same. So it turns out that this particular stream is never the value of an output of the function b. 
So the enumeration B is not an enumeration of all of the bit streams. It missed some out. So this argument was totally general. It worked for whatever enumeration you give me. So no enumeration of bit streams is an enumeration of all of the bit streams. Every enumeration leaves some out. So what we've shown is that the collection of sets is now divided at least into three different zones. We've got the finite sets and we've got the infinite sets, but the infinite sets can be divided into the countable ones and the uncountable ones. We've seen that the set of all bit streams is uncountable, but we'll see in class that the set of all real numbers, for example, is uncountable and there's going to be lots of other sorts of collections which exceed the grasp of being uh, enumerated. But now that we've got these distinctions in hand, we're going to look at another example of another two examples of the, the limits and the power of predicate logic. We're going to look at one case where we're going to look at what we can say and what we can't say about the boundary between the finite and the infinite. And we're also going to see what we can say about models and the relationship between countable collections and uncountable collections and how that can be reflected in models of predicate logic and what we can model with them. So that's going to be the focus of the next video.